this in our first song, and then we'll go from there. Becca. When she wrote first, last, first. I'll be reading from Proverbs 3, 1 through 7. Proverbs 3, 1 through 7. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life, and years they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in sight of the God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Neighbor with a con of animals. We have a big blue book and all sorts of animals at home. One of our favorite things to do for animals is to build a zoo for them. We take our blocks and then we make walls tall enough so they can't escape. We make rooms big enough so they can grow and play. When Nehemiah told those workers a long time ago to rise up and build, they had to work as a name like me and my brother. Their building was tall enough so they can keep themselves, their friends, and family safe. God built something for you and me that does all the things to do in the zoo that goes for our animals and the walls here for Jerusalem. He built the church. Sometimes the world is scary, but when I'm at church, I always feel safe. There are teachers and preachers and elders to help me grow and understand the Bible and how God wants me to live. 
Third Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each another up. Even though I'm only seven years old, I can send cards, visit the sick help, clean the bathroom meals, all sorts of things. Building up the church can sometimes feel like you are busy with all the different people that, all, that do all different things. But when the church is being built the right way, just like the zoo, it's such a good place to be. Have you been helping build up the church? Four fifty four, four fifty four, first to last verse. I'll be reading Matthew 7, 24 27. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat on that house and it did fall just to found it on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine 
And thus them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and fell, and the great was the fall of it. Has anyone ever said to you, it's in my blood? I didn't really understand what you meant, but I've heard it a lot. When people say it to me, they mean baseball. Baseball is in my blood. My dad played in college. He coached our local high school team for many years. My cousin is about to start his first season at his college. And me, I'm pretty sure my parents put a ball in my hand my first day on planet Earth. When I thought about this year's legislators theme, Rosalind up and build. It reminds me of my time playing ball. Baseball is a very fundamental sport. It takes time, practice, and even when it comes to rising up and building your life to serve God, it takes all those things too. Let's talk about each one. God wants parents to teach their kids from the very beginning to love him and to learn his word. Just like in baseball, a lot of time has been putting put up into building up my respect and knowledge of God. I know that my mom and dad prayed for me. I know that as soon as I arrived, they started telling me what a great God made me. They brought me to every Bible class and worship service. As I grew and began to rise up on my own, I know that that's the most important thing. Uh, I knew that serving God is the most important thing I will ever do. Practice isn't always Practice makes perfect. That is definitely true in baseball. Did you know that experts say that good baseball players hit safely three out of ten tries and field ground balls nine out of ten tries? And so when you're watching those major league baseball players, just know that that took tons of practice. It takes practice to learn what God expects of us and to teach others how amazing our God is. We're going to make mistakes, but constant effort and practice will make us better servants for him. James even reminds us in James 1.25 that the person who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, or someone who doesn't give up and keeps practicing, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. But practice isn't always fun. But just like the verse says, if we keep after and follow through, we will be rewarded. Something I started hearing from day one of playing baseball is these six words. Keep our eye on the ball. If we aren't focusing on the ball, not only will we fail, we, you could get hurt. If we take our eyes off Jesus, we are bound from sin. And when we sin, we are hurt ourselves and others. We must learn from Peter when he saw Jesus walking on water. We must we learn from Matthew fourteen thirty that he saw the wind, he was afraid, and began to sink. Just like Peter, if we get caught up in the storms around us and take our eyes off Jesus, we will sink into the ugliness of the world. Like I said in the beginning, baseball is in my blood. I love the game. My dad has been my coach every step of the way. He's a great coach because he loves the game too and he understands how to make me and my teammates better players. When it comes to rising up and better, building your life to be the best it can be, there is no greater God than my Heavenly Father. He loves me, he understands me, and he knows how to give me a eternal life in heaven with him. As long as I put in the time, practice, even when it gets hard, and concentrate on him, as much as I love that baseball is in my blood, my goal is to be covered by the blood of Jesus is building your life for Christ in your blood.
number 808. We will be singing her twice. Blessed is the man who walks not counsel on God, but stands away, says, what sits away, scribble, that the, his lies the law, and on his law he meditates day and night, shall be like a tree planted by rivers of waters. I bring forth this season, this leaf shall not wither, for every dust prospers. I love baseball. I love to watch baseball, talk about baseball, and especially to play baseball. I love being on the field with my teammates to play a game or to get better in practice. We're always trying to build up one another in our skills to better play the game. I love serving God. I love being with the Christians, learning about God, and serving God together. We're, I'm always learning and being pushed to be built into the best Christian possible. <coughs> when I think of being built up as a servant of Nehemiah, I think of what the people said to when I think of being built up as a servant of God, I think of what the people said to Nehemiah when he encouraged them to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And he said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Nehemiah 2 19. Whether you were like the people of God trying to build up the walls around Jerusalem, a Christian trying to grow, or trying to build up his baseball skills, there are several similarities to succeed at each one. One must have the right mindset, attention to fundamentals, and willing to practice all the time. First, you must have the right mindset. You must first want to succeed at getting better in your understanding and the playing of the game. Part of this is knowing that you'll make mistakes. Everyone is going to miss a ground ball, a catch, or a pitch. You cannot be afraid of that. You must give it your best with every opportunity. The same is true for, for growing as a Christian. Esther 17 tells us that we must first want to grow in our walk with God and our understanding of the things of God. We're all going to mess up in our walk with God, but we cannot let our mistakes keep us from continuing to grow in God. Second, we, understand, we must understand the basics of the game. You, may not, you must never grow on the basics of baseball. To succeed, you must feel the ball, hit the ball, and always have ball awareness. It doesn't matter how fast you are or how strong you are if you, if you, can't, if you cannot do the most basic things in baseball. As, as Christians, we understand the basics of our faith. We're always, worship, we're always worshiping God with his people, and a Christian, a Christian must make the habit to read their Bible daily. It doesn't matter how smart you are or how or what great things you may do in life if you fill out the most fundamental things of the Christian life. Finally, in baseball, we must be disciplined to practice well. You and I must be committed to giving your best. To, you must be committed to giving it your best 
and Emma practice in game. This means putting in the work even when you don't feel like it. As a new football coach for Auburn, Hugh Freeze said, your commitment must be stronger than your feelings. The same is true for the Christian life. You and I must be, you and I must seek to give our very best. Colossians 3, you and I must be disciplined enough to practice what we believe. Every day we seek to give our very best. Colossians 3, 23, my best today may not be as good as yesterday, but it is the best I have today, and I'm going to give it all to God. This means to give my, this also means that I will give my best to God even when I don't feel like it. By taking my favorite sport, baseball, we have now seen how growth takes place in Christianity. It takes the right mindset, attention to fundamentals, and discipline, and discipline necessary to practice all the time. If I'm willing to do this for a sport, shouldn't I be willing to rise up and build my walk with God? I'll be reading Nehemiah 2, verse 17, NIV version. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will not no longer be in disgrace. I'll be reading Thursday Sermons 5, 11 through 15. Therefore, encourage one another and build each another up, as you are already doing. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to, the, to those who labor among you and admonish you. And to regard them fairly highly in love be because of their work. Be at peace um, um, among brothers and sisters. Warn those who are idle. Comfort the discourse. Disgrace, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Auburn University has always been a special place to me. I never really had a choice about loving Auburn. No, my parents met and attended there. I grew up watching football games every Saturday and occasionally making the trip down south. I immediately fell in love with the atmosphere. The same is true for the Molten Church of Christ. Not only did my parents attend here, but so did my great-grandparents, grandparents, cousins, aunts, and uncles. As both places are special to me, I would like to see both of them be built up and to succeed. To discuss building up the church, I would like to look at what Cadillac did last year to the Auburn football team and see how his work can help us in the church. Cadillac is the embodiment of an Auburn man. He was a running back in 2001 to 2004. In his senior year, he led the team to an undefeated season, SEC championship, and a Sugar Bowl victory. In 2019, Cadillac returned to Auburn as a new running backs coach. When Brian Harson was dismissed, the football uh, when Brian Harson was dismissed, the football team was a wreck. 
He was called upon to lead the team for the next four games. As I stated, the football program was in shambles. The locker room was divided, and they had been demoralized by crushing defeat. Their efforts on and off the field did not live up to the Auburn standard. Then Cadillac took over the program, and there was immediate and visible difference. They started playing with pride for their team and for the brother next to them. Everyone on the outside unanimously agreed that this was the Cadillac effect. He clearly was emotional on the sidelines and in the post-game press conferences. There was no doubt that he loved the Auburn football team. With this connection to the program, the turnaround was swift. With an underdeveloped and discouraged team, he carried them to a 2-2 two two record. Regardless of the record, the most notable change was the energy, effort, and passion in which the players were playing with. He became a national sensation. The change shocked the world, and some fans even lobbied for him to be the next head coach at Auburn. Although this didn't work out, the new coach appointed him as the associate head coach in just a few days. Cadillac's turnaround of Auburn leads me to think about the turnaround that was led by Nehemiah and the turnaround that is always necessary inside the church. Nehemiah, like Cadillac, was connected to the people in the city of God. He was a Jew serving the king in a foreign land. Upon hearing of the desolation that characterized the people of God, he was moved to tears in prayer. Nehemiah was passionate about the city of God. It was the capital of his homeland. However, it is most likely that he was born in captivity and had never been to Jerusalem. But this did not weaken his love for the city. Like Nehemiah, Christians have, been, like Nehemiah, Christians have a connection to the church. Having been saved, the church is our family. We're, we should always be interested and passionate about the church's success. In the church, everyone should have an obligation to lead and to participate in change that is in the right direction of the church. Nehemiah, like Cadillac, cared deeply about the city of God. When he was told that they had been demoralized and were making no efforts to improve, he was heartbroken. And he couldn't bear to see the people, of, the people of God in this way. In the church, we must care deeply about the church. If the church is acting demoralized and failing to get the name of Jesus to the world, it should bother all of us. Nehemiah was willing to act in faith. He volunteered for service to lead change upon Jerusalem. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, he encouraged and rallied the people to rise up and build. The, people, the, people he, the energy he brought to the people was evident, especially when you consider they built the walls in just 52 days. If Cadillac can do it with Auburn and Nehemiah can do it with Jerusalem, we can do it with the church. We can bring new and renewed energy inside the church. We can make massive improvements in just a short amount of time if we we're willing to go to work. Cadillac helped turn around the Auburn football program because he was connected to the program and he cared. Nehemiah helped turn around Jerusalem because he was connected to the city and he really cared deeply about the, pity, the people in the city. If they can do it, we can do it. Will the Moulton Church of Christ be a turnaround story? We will be singing Seek You First, 883, 883, the first and third verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. 
Brooke and Ryan and everybody else said I needed so much work, they enrolled me in the program. And so that's why I'm participating right now. And uh, <clears throat> no, we're glad that everybody is here and uh, being able to support these kids and, and what they've been able to do. And um, it's amazing the potential that kids have if you give them the opportunity. And especially, this is the crazy thing I was thinking about sitting here listening to them, is that this was done in a short window year. This was not a normal lads to leaders year that we had to operate with. This was in a short window. You can only imagine what can happen when that window opens and we get even more time and they get more experience, what is gonna be able to be done through them and by them. And one of the reasons why we cared about this program and um, our elders who have supported it very strongly from the very beginning uh, in every way possible they have supported us even those mr teddy I, I remember even though he's not serving as an elder now he was very much in support of it when we first began the process of talking about it and one of the reasons why this is so important to us is number one because kids mattered to jesus they always did as a matter of fact one of the reasons that jesus showed frustration in his ministry was when adults tried to keep children from him. He was extremely frustrated by that and rebuked his disciples and said, no, you let them come here. They always have a place with me and I always have time for them. And so as the church, we have to make that um, a very important process for us as well. I also think about Jesus as a child. A couple of texts we mentioned this morning in Luke chapter 2 when Jesus is 12 years old and he went to Jerusalem with his parents, the only glimpse we have into his childhood. Um, <clears throat> so he's there and he's learning. And you remember, he, his family leaves him behind, but he, he stays behind in Jerusalem asking doctors of the law questions. He's interacting, to put it in perspective, he's interacting with PhDs in the law. And they're astonished at his ability as a child at 12 to answer questions and to ask such insightful questions. Where did he learn that from? As another text we mentioned this morning in Luke 4 and verse 16, it says Jesus went into the synagogue at Nazareth to begin his ministry. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue. Not only did he go in the synagogue, but he grabbed the scroll and began to read. He was a, he was a participant in public worship from a very young age and that carried over into 30 years plus when he became an adult and began his public ministry. It was something that was important that even the Son of God was involved in the development of the individual and of children. But also in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2 we have a, a command from Paul as he is passing the baton to Timothy and he says the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now when you read that text in English, the word men could lead you to, con to conclude that he's talking about male leadership. But that's where Greek language is far superior to English language. Because the word he uses is anthropos, like anthropology, the study of humankind. It encompasses all of mankind, not just male instruction, but female instruction. And uh, I'm judging, I haven't had a chance to talk to Brooke much, but I'm judging by the fact that she was wiping her eyes after the girls did their stuff. I'm going to say it probably went pretty well. But there is that constant need to pass on faith to the successive generations. Titus 2, we see it again, the older women to teach the younger women. And so it's something that we're always interested in. Jesus spent time with his disciples. You have, you could look at tons of mentoring relationships, Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, Paul and Timothy and Titus. You could look at Peter and John Mark. The Bible is filled with them, of individuals who invested in and helped them to become who they are. And one of the reasons why a program like this is especially important is, first of all, I'm not necessarily a gloom and doom mentality type of person. I don't think things are necessarily as bad as some people want them to want us to believe they are. But sometimes in interactions with people who have that gloom and doom personality that say, you know, I'm worried about the world my kids are growing up in. Okay? That's, that's fair to be concerned. But my question back to those individuals is always this. 
What are you doing to change it? Because you have control right now as an adult to shape the future that your children inherit. And so we can either sit back and complain or we can get on our feet and we can invest in kids and we can invest in the world and we can change the world for them. That's our choice. We have to make that choice. And so <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why we think that this is so important, not just this program. And we have kids who are here tonight who will not be going to convention, but they still came. They still took the benefits of the program without actually participating in what we consider to be the reward side, to head to Nashville and to be able to, to have some fun and to participate uh, with other people. So, um, again, we're grateful that uh, everybody has been behind this from the very beginning. We've had overwhelming support from every single person. And um, so we hope that this becomes the new norm and uh, this uh, really takes off because we've got a talented group of kids. And uh, in time, they can be really special people. Uh, they are special kids now, but imagine what they can be when they're adults with the investment of time. And so <clears throat> we're grateful that you were here tonight. And um, as always is true, as we've mentioned about mentoring relationships, we always want to try and help people in their walk of faith, wherever that is. And so um, if there's anything we could ever do to help anybody in their walk of faith, whether you come here or not, that, that's not our concern. Our concern is that we can help people, period. And so <clears throat> in a moment, Kate is going to lead us in a song. He's, and then I think Drew is going to lead another song and close us out. And then Jackson uh, will have our closing prayer. Kate. On behalf of the eldership here at Moulton, I want to thank you young men and young ladies for the courage that you've shown to get up here and do what you did. And it's our prayer you continue to grow in the Lord's word and his work. You know, Drew, as he read 1 Thessalonians 5, hit the nail on the head. 
encourage and build each other up. Parents, thank you. Grandparents, thank you. Friends and family, thank you for getting these young men and young women here where they could practice, for investing time in them at home because we can see from the results when they get here, they weren't just working on it here, they worked on it at home. And we want to thank you for that. And we would like to encourage you to continue to work with them. And like Brad said, I'm excited to see how this is going to turn out. Lord willing, or if he lets me stick around long enough. But, and I know y'all are too. Um, Drew is going to come and, and lead us in a closing song, and we'll have a word of prayer. And as he leads us in this closing song, if you did not have an opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper this morning and would like to, you can exit and go down to the conference room, and there'll be someone there waiting to serve you. If you are going to the convention in Nashville, when service is dismissed, if you would please meet here in the front of the auditorium. Six fifty five, six fifty five. I'll be singing those of our three. I'll be doing first and last verse. There's a fact. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I come to you thanking you for everything you've given us, all the wonderful many blessings, dear Lord. Dear Lord, can you please help all the people in your need, all the sick, all the homeless, military, everyone that needs you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, I hope that everyone has safe travels heading home tonight, and I just want to thank you for everything, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>